Hello and welcome to Magic for Beginners. If only that was the class I was teaching. If only I could teach that class. How fantastic that would be. Um, welcome to Kelly Link and uh, Magical Realism is what we're going to be focusing on today. So I'm just going to give you a brief introductory lecture and to give you a couple of things to think about before we go into the seminar when I actually see you in person next week. So um, Kelly Link is a contemporary author. This is Magic for Beginners. Um, this is probably her best book, although all of them are absolutely fantastic. Um, she's an American writer, very much active today. Um, she's also an editor, so she is part of a publishing house. She also edits various magazines. She is absolutely astonishing, and she's very remarkable for being a very um, low-key author who, who isn't sort of particularly flashy and particularly... Um, prolific in her, public, in her publicity, but just reliably produces absolutely astonishing short stories. Um, I have asked you for this session to read Stone Animals, which is in the Magic for Beginners collection. Um, there are many other uh, of her short stories which are available online. I, I think all of Magic for Beginners is actually available online, um, but it's also it's in the library as well. And I think the others that I would particularly recommend, uh, Hortlack is phenomenal and absolutely bizarre. Hortlack is a, essentially a guy working in a, um, in like a services, like in a, a motorway services kind of thing, but it's a motorway services that's next to the abyss and from the abyss regularly come zombies and the zombies come in and kind of the problem with this is that the zombies don't buy anything and they're just in the way. Um, I mean, there's a lot, some, a lot of them kind of fairy handbag and indeed cat skin are both much more um, fairy tale like. So uh, some zombie, zombie contingency plans are also, also an amazing short story in which uh, an ex-convict called Soap comes, crashes a party and goes up to all these people and basically tries to work out if they have a zombie contingency plan. Um, so I think if, if you get into this, which I, I really hope you will because they're an awful lot of fun, there is an awful lot out there and please read and read indiscriminately and just grab all of it and consume it because it's so, so much fun. Um, so let's just, first of all, before we get into talking about stone animals, um, let's just define magical realism. And um, it's also sometimes called magic realism or um, marvelous realism. Uh, and so this is basically uh, something that is very much grounded in the real world. Um, tries to tell stories in a, in a realistic way, as we might expect with some, you know, sort of more literary fiction, but brings in magical elements and kind of just sort of accepts them as normal. So it's not, um, it's not high fantasy set in another world, and it's not even um, concept fantasy that, or, or concept sci-fi that's sort of looking at major magical elements and saying okay so then this happened and wow amazing you know we have suddenly have magic and what are we going to do with it it's it's much more just accepting of that and having that as a background as a way to tell more ordinary everyday stories um i think some of the some of the really big players in magical realism um okay so link obviously is fantastic uh salman rushdie many of his stories i think most most of the ones that I've read uh, are very uh, magical realism. Toni Morrison, actually. Uh, Toni Morrison, we tend not to think of as magical realism because often a lot of it is straight up realism. Uh, but she has strong folkloric elements that come into her stories. And they are, um, you realize if you, if you look closely at them, you can't take those elements out. So if you read, you know, sometimes it's sort of ghost things like the the, the baby in Beloved, but also if you look at uh, something like Sula, which is one of my absolute favorite novels, it's really astonishing, you know. Sula comes to town and the same day she comes to town, a plague of robins comes. Um, and so you kind of get the feel like, oh, maybe this is a story that's been passed down from generations and generations and exaggerated each time. And it acquires this kind of uh, fantastic, as I say, folkloric. Um, element. Um, other writers, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's a strong uh, Polish tradition and um, Olga Tork, 
Tokartsuk, I think I'm saying that right, my sincere apologies if I'm not, um, is she's somebody who has been getting a lot of attention recently for the really incredible work that she's she's doing and her works again have just these little bloomings of fantastical elements. Uh, and so some of the link stories are very high key magical realism. So the um, the kind of the uh, service station next to the abyss is just straight up, you know, from the very first page, we know this is a service station at the edge of the abyss. Stone animals is slightly more sneaky. Uh, we don't immediately know that there's any science fiction fantasy, um, not science fiction at all, but any fantasy element to it. It begins very much as a family moving into a new house. And we start to kind of see the, um, the issues, the problems that are circulating this family. We start to see where they are falling apart at the seams quite quickly. I think we, we get the, um, the indications of what might potentially go wrong there. And it's only bit by bit as the story goes on um, that we get the sensation that there's something not right that's beyond just the family dynamic. Uh, we get this notion, you know, it starts off with this, the child and we know the child, you know, the, the younger boy is, we know he's a little bit awkward. He gets a little fussy, a little picky about certain things. Um, and then he starts to say, oh, his toothbrush is haunted. He doesn't, he, he won't brush his teeth because his toothbrush is haunted. And that kind of thing is quite easy to dismiss the first time through. Oh, okay, this is just the kind of thing that little children say. Uh, but as we go on, more and more things get haunted and everyone in the house starts to have certain things they consider haunted. So um, even though they're all kind of saying haunted isn't the right word, they're not haunted, but they, they're aware that they have a strong emotional response to these things. And the other thing is rabbits. There are two stone rabbits out on the lawn, uh, out at the front of the house. Very kind of dramatic, striking feature. Uh, some story that a uh, previous owner was a sculptor or, or new sculptors or something like this. Um, but there are hundreds of rabbits who come onto the lawn at night. Again, kind of thing that can be quite natural. That can be quite, you know, animals overrun places, totally fine. Nothing intrinsically, um, fantastical about large gatherings of rabbits uh, but then the more and more we see so it's, it's a really clever slow bloom of a story uh, because the more and more we see we find a little tiny bow and arrow and then daughter gets shot with something in her hand she's peering really closely at a rabbit and it seems to be wearing a bridle and is there someone really tiny writing it? Um, and if you've gotten right to the end of the story, and by the way, you should have read the story before listening to this, because I'm just going to spoil everything. Spoiler alert should be taken for granted, I think, in a, any kind of um, creative writing literature class. Um, by the end of it, Henry, the husband, has become one of the rabbit writers. Right, the very last thing that happens is that he sees the rabbit. And he's like, oh, of course, there's a rabbit for me. And he mounts the rabbit and goes into war. And we know that there's going to be some kind of massive battle, which is a fascinating place to end a story because you could write a high fantasy story that's about a battle between humans and rabbits and the tiny people that ride rabbits. And you would start there. And in a way, it's almost like the, the, the fantastical element isn't what's important in magical realism. It is the means by which we comprehend the real world that we're in. Um, which isn't to say that it's not very powerful and very symbolic and whatever we get, uh, whatever the magic is, we should definitely listen to it very carefully. Um, but for most magical realism, it's really about the, um, the analogy and how we can bring it back to, to the realism element. So let's, um, let's think about that element because why use it? I think that's one of the things. Um, why bring in this fant fantastical element? Um, it can be very powerful to externalize what is very familiar. It does not take us long to see that this family is incredibly dysfunctional. Um, 
so Henry and Catherine, even from right at the very beginning, Henry and Catherine are the, the, the husband and wife. Um, they're there at the beginning, they're looking at the house. And even just this, we kind of see that Henry isn't completely sure. He makes a joke right at the beginning. First thing he makes this joke with the estate agent saying, oh, presumably what he asks is, is it haunted? We don't get that. The, the story starts with Henry asked a question. He was joking. As a matter of fact, the way the station snapped, it is. Um, so Henry, and Henry, when he's here, hears that, he glances over at his wife to see if she's heard and doesn't say anything. Then we kind of go into um, the wife's mind and we hear all about what she's feeling. So we straight away, we realize these are two people who aren't telling each other the truth. They aren't entirely open with each other. There is a fundamental discord here between them. Um, and so this, the magic, the hauntedness of the house, the rabbits become a fascinating way to explore that in a new way. Um, I think it's nice because there's a lot of misdirection because I think we're sort of supposed to think that, uh, you know, Catherine is having, having another baby. Um, baby number three. They've moved out of the city, out of New York. Henry is constantly going back. He can't quite let go of his job. He can't, he's, he's tied to that. And there are various questions about, um, about love and what does he love more? His, which of his children does he love more? Does he love his children more than his wife? Does he love his wife more than his children? Does he love his job more than his family? Um, and Henry never quite knows. Henry sort of tries to reassure himself certain things. And then we kind of, so like he says between, about the children, his, his wife says, oh, what are you worried that you love one of the children more? And he says, no, I love them both the same. Um, and she thinks that's not true, but you don't even know it. Uh, she, she I, I, I would argue that she is our protagonist here. And that is a slightly difficult thing to argue. Uh, because of the absolutely astonishing um, narrative form of this short story. Um, let's, let's talk about um, perspective and then I'll talk about detail because the detail is, it is so dense. Um, so let's, we'll talk about the perspective and as I do that, I'll try and um, weigh up this kind of uh, notion of main character is not because Henry starts it off and in a way, we should think Henry is the main character because Henry asks the question right at the beginning and then right at the end, it's Henry getting on the, the rabbit and going into the warfare. But Henry is so passive in this whole story. Um, in terms of perspective, uh, we have an omniscient narrative, right? So omniscient, probably gone over the summer already, but just in case not, omniscient means all knowing. So uh, you can have limited narrative, you can have first person narrative, which is I did this, I think this, I did that, whatever. Okay, your, your character is speaking out to, to the reader. Uh, you can have third person narrative, which is she did this, he did this, whatever. Um, you can have third person limited, which means you're entirely following the thoughts um, of one character and you don't know anything that one, you don't know anything um, that that character wouldn't know. So we don't tell the reader anything that that one character doesn't know. Uh, and then there's omniscient, which means we can just jump, in, jump into absolutely anyone's mind. This is what this person's thinking, this is what this person's thinking, this is what this person's thinking. And obviously there's a huge scale there from limited, only knowing what one person is thinking to omniscient, uh, knowing what everyone's thinking. And of course you can also um, have a narrative where you don't know. Um, which is a lot of fun. But anyway, so what we have here is an omniscient narrative. We can jump into any single person's mind at any point. So we know what Henry thinks, we know what Catherine thinks, uh, we know what the children think. We also very occasionally jump into external characters, uh, mindsets. And this is quite interesting because we, we get little tiny snapshots into them. So I think the only two people that immediately come to mind are the estate agent and the crocodile, who is Henry's boss. Um, she's called the crocodile because she has these sort of watery eyes and they're called crocodile tears. Um, 
And I think this is really interesting because we kind of get glimpses into their lives. We get the reassurance that they are 3D characters with worlds and feelings and thoughts. But we also kind of shut them out because they are not part of this story. Essentially, the rabbits don't influence them. <laughs> uh, neither of them have names. Uh, for the estate agent, it's something of a running joke that at the beginning, neither of the, you know, neither Henry nor um, nor Catherine can remember the estate agent's name when they're standing there and she's showing them around. A little bit later, we learn that she knows that nobody knows her name, and that's why she wears really tight sc skirts. Uh, like that's kind of her only way of getting people's attention or something, and we can tell how uncomfortable she is with her tight skirts because she's always pushing them down, pulling them down. Um, and also, she she sort of we get in go into her mindset and we learn that she doesn't mind that no one remembers her name and it's going to be okay because she really wants to write uh romance fiction and she is constantly coming up with pseudonyms for that so even when we're in her own thoughts we don't get her name uh, we get all these other names that she tries on and that is the kind of detail that um link is absolutely extraordinary at she will just drop us into this character's uh, mindset and give you just the tiniest thing that opens up so, so, so much. Um, with the crocodile, we get much less sympathy for the crocodile, um, perhaps because she's constantly called the crocodile and all we know really about her is that she has a huge rubber band ball. She's constantly adding these rubber bands onto these rubber band balls. So she's associated with tension, with rubber, which is a kind of false, um, false fabric in some way. Um, and she's always trying to twist Henry's arm and make him stay a little bit later, make him work a little bit harder. Um, does Henry fancy her? Are we supposed to think that maybe Henry's having an affair with her? Uh, almost, but also definitely, we know that that's definitely not what's happening. The one time we get confidence from Henry is when he says he loves his job. Um, and although there's some kind of suggestion of, oh, maybe, maybe, there is definitely nothing going on between them because we have the wonderful bit where Catherine says, like, I wish you were having an affair. So if you were having an affair, you'd be more careful and you'd come home to me more so I didn't get suspicious. Um, and the affair is a very pointed thing because we, we know that this relationship has been going wrong for some time to the extent that Catherine decides to tell Henry that she had an affair with one of her colleagues. And it's not true. She tells him this because she knows that he will be good at fixing that problem because he loves his work so much and in work he's always fixing problems, putting out fires. Um, and so she gives him this problem of, oh yeah, 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 no, no, I had, I had an affair. So that he has to solve that, he has to fix that. They have to put all this effort into saving their relationship but they've can now kind of saved their relationship. They've conceived another child and he's back to work. And she kind of knows she can't keep doing that. She's sort of waiting for him to save the marriage because she's she's done, she's made her a big stand and now she's kind of waiting for him. And so while we would kind of like to see the crocodile as an antagonist, as someone who is um, keeping Henry, someone who is you know either the rival love interest or someone who's keeping Henry, we kind of know that she doesn't much care about Henry because of the crocodile tears. We know that she knows how to manipulate him. She knows how to get him there. He is a useful employee at the end of the day. So we, we jump into, yes, peripheral characters' mindsets, but also, you know, obviously very significantly central characters' mindsets. And I would argue that this is Catherine's story because, because now I need to justify that. Um, we, we live where Catherine is. So there are, there's a fantastic bit. So if we go, you know, a few days, a few, excuse me, a few pages through, uh, through the story, Henry uh, has to go back to work. And then we jump days, the days that he is not there, we just leapfrog, we go right over them. Um, there's a little bit of slightly confusing, um, he wakes up at 4 a.m. So he leaves at six, he wakes up at four, he, leaves at, he wakes up at six, in, at 6.45 in the morning, I think it is, he calls Catherine, uh, they have a little conversation. He's just arrived in New York. And then he next calls her at 4 a.m. And we sort of have to do a double take and realize an entire day has passed and we've been told nothing about it. 
because it's outside of the story. It's Henry at work. This is where the family doesn't happen. We, we see these tiny, limited views of, um, of Henry at work. We get these little snippets of dialogue between him and the crocodile, but there's so much that we don't see that's outside of this story, the heart of this story. Whereas we keep coming back to Catherine um, and the rabbits and her feeling about the rabbits and her trying to get him to do something, to pick a side in some way. So she goes off, she meets the neighbors. She has all these adventures with family, with the next door kids. Um, and he can't see them. It's very interesting looking at what Henry can't see. He never sees the neighbors, even though he's in the house with the neighbors at one point, he doesn't see them. Um, he, sometimes he can't see Catherine. He likes to look at the house, but he can't see Catherine. And then he turns around and she's frowning and he starts to feel differently about things. In terms of looking at of, of looking at what we can learn from Link as a writer, look at her description of character. It's astonishing how much she can give us in such a little, little time. Um, one of my favorite things, right at the end of the first page, um, we are introducing an awful lot of characters right at the beginning. Um, and, and really being very bold, she introduces the estate agent, who is a character, you know, a very disposable character, a character who will be gone. Um, pop some more light on. A character who will be gone in absolutely no time. But Link lets us meet her and also introduces Henry, Catherine, Carlton, and Tilly. All at once, the whole family. That's difficult to do. Now, one of the most tempting things when we're introducing characters is that we sit down and go, I don't know why we sit down, but somehow we sit down when we start writing. We sit down and we say, okay, so Tilly was 10 years old. She had long black hair and dark skin and she wore yellow dresses. Okay, none of that may be true. Uh, in a way that doesn't matter. There's, there's Tilly in my head. I, I have a little picture of her that has come. We don't get physical description. We get physical description of Catherine because she's pregnant. We get physical description of her stomach and how her getting fatter and how the children don't like that she's getting fatter. Uh, we know that Henry briefly has a beard. Other than that, I don't think we get anything else about what they look like, what their hair colors. We always want to describe people's hair colors. Hair color is the least important thing in the world. Um, <laughs> if you think your character's hair color is important, you're probably not writing an interesting enough character. When, um, when Link gives us, introduces us to these characters, she gives us really precise bits of information. Um, so right here, let's, let's, let's actually look, we'll look at two bits. Um, I think the first one that's interesting is that we see Catherine through Henry's eyes first. Um, so, this is just the sort of third paragraph down. Henry looks over to see if Catherine had heard. She had, she had her head tilted. Sorry, dyslexic, bear with me. <laughs> she had her head up the, til the tiled fireplace as if she were trying it on to see whether it fit. Catherine was six months pregnant. Nothing fit except her, except for Henry's baseball caps, his sweatpants, his t-shirts. But she liked that fireplace. So there's a really small thing here that she is, um, they're wandering around the house, they're looking at the house, they're buying it, and she sort of tries the fireplace on as if, to see if it would fit. Um, this is sort of a, a, an American phrase in there, which might be slightly jarring to us, but it's absolutely um, acceptable in, uh, in US grammar. Um, but what Henry then says is that nothing fits Catherine. She's pregnant and nothing fits her. And it's just the implication that, yes, we're talking very, very strictly physically about what clothes fit her. But also there's an implication that he thinks nothing is going to fit her because she's she's being difficult and challenging and he doesn't quite understand what it is that she needs. Um, the next paragraph down that we get the most fantastic introduction to Tilly. And in a way we kind of need to do a little bit of work on Tilly because we briefly introduced Henry briefly 
Uh, actually, we've got quite a bit on Henry, brief little bit on Catherine, a little bit on Carlton, until he's now the fourth name that we've had thrown at us in as many paragraphs. And we get introduced to Tilly's entire character in about two sentences and perfect. So Tilly's sitting on the landing, reading a book, legs poking out through the railings. Whenever Carlton ran past, he thumped her on the head, but Tilly never said a word. Carlton would be sorry later and never even know why. And in that, we get all of Tilly's psychology. We get a, an absolute insight into this person. Um, they are in a way patient. Um, they're not going to make a fuss, but they are vindictive. They are gonna get their way. They are gonna exact justice in their own specific way, but not even, not, not, they're not gonna tell us. And I think that's a very interesting depiction, both of an individual person, but also a brother sister relationship kind of opens the door. So when you are creating your character, I think really important to think, um, what information is going to illuminate my characters here? What I really want them to know. And, you know, Link hasn't at any point said, Tilly was patient but scheming, long suffering of her, her brother, but would exact justice. No, just that one little bit of information. It's not telling us directly, it's just showing us this is the kind of person she is, this is the kind of thing she's going to do. She's going to get her brother back some way. And you won't know why, but he will suffer. I love that. I think Tilly is one of my favorite characters in this um, in this story because she's just kind of vicious. She also sleepwalks, which is just so much fun. Um, okay, so I think um, I think that's probably the main part that I want. That's the main stuff I want to introduce you to before we get together and um, talk about it in some depth. Uh, make sure you have read this story, read it severally. Yes, it is quite long uh, for a short story. Uh, it is worth reading a couple of times. You may well get to the end and go, Neh? with the whole Henry becoming one of the rabbits and well, one of the rabbit riders and uh, starting a war. Uh, but go back to the beginning and take your time with it. Um, annotate it, circle the things you love, circle the things you don't understand. Um, I will do my best <laughs> to uh, look through, but also there are some, some interesting things, some funny little bits and pieces that, uh, well, I think it will be interesting to debate together. Uh, we are going to be doing a writing exercise in the class, which I'll just tell you about just now. Um, I'm not expecting you to do it beforehand, but um, you might want to just sort of start thinking about it a little bit. Uh, so what we're going to do is kind of start scheming a potential magical realism story. So I want you to think of some really everyday situations and magic them up. Uh, so, you know, waiting on the bus, getting coffee, going to the dentist, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, just think of something really, really mundane and then try and kind of expand those into something magical. And then very importantly, I'm waving a paintbrush at you. This is a paintbrush on my desk. This isn't relevant by the way. <laughs> it's just what I happen to be playing. Uh, and then once you've kind of played around with some ideas of magic or whatever magic it might be, so it can be, you know, if you want to bring in zombies or enchanted rabbits, whatever you want. Um, then just kind of say, okay, what, what is the metaphorical power? What is the conceit here? How would this relate back? What insight does this give? If we look at this story, the rabbits are, they're burrowing under the house. They're undermining the house, like very literally undermining, mining beneath it. Um, the children are almost turning into rabbits. There's a suggestion that Catherine might give birth to a rabbit. Um, there is a kind of going back to something simple and, and holistic and simple and wholesome for the family of moving out to the country, having this baby, wanting to be really natural and away from the city. 
and yet Henry creating this warring force where he's trying to go back to the city, he's not quite letting them have what they want. It's all the old stuff from the old house that's haunted. Um, it's not so much the new things that they're getting. Um, it's that old life that's hanging with them. And so the rabbits are the tension between these two different versions of, um, of these two different lives that they could have. So in that sense, the rabbits have a very distinct, um, perhaps a very subtle, and perhaps we could argue something slightly different from that, but a very interesting metaphorical purpose. Um, there's no great interest in introducing a metaphorical conceit that has no purpose other than weirdness. Like, okay, sure, I was like, uh, yeah, I'm getting coffee, I'm in the coffee shop, and also there are seals swimming in the air around the baristas. I mean, that's kind of cool. But if that doesn't mean anything, it's just seals. It's just, it's just a bit of weird Photoshop, essentially. Um, and so what I really want you to think of quite carefully is what kind of things suggest something deeper about the story. So don't feel you need to come up with anything final uh, before the session, because we're going to actually do that in class, but I just thought I would start waving those things that you might want to think about. Um, so you can set your mind a brewing, and we will do that exercise in class, and it should be a lot of fun and hopefully come up with something really interesting. Okay, read some Kelly Link, read Stone Animals, go and read anything else of hers. I'll be super excited to hear your thoughts, and take care, everyone. I will see you all soon.